Hey folks, welcome to Real Movies Fake History. My name's Gaz. And I'm Mel. And this is a podcast where each episode we're going to be discussing a single movie based around the historical context it was produced to determine whether the history that's portrayed is real or fake. So we're talking this week about The Great Escape, 1963, directed by John Sturges. There's a lot of men in this cast. and let me just, Only men in this cast, so Gary. I think there's only men. Only men. I feel a bit bad about that. And I w- actually, we're going to talk about this. We are. Okay. This is also the movie that makes Steve McQueen a superstar, international superstar. And uh, w- what an incredible film. I feel like I was born and had seen this movie. Really? I feel like it. I, I don't remember even the is first time. Is that because time. it's so iconic and there are so other many movies who have kind of emulated, not the whole movie, but aspects of it. I don't remember the first time I watched it. You know, I, I was born and already seen it. Did you it. not watch it with your dad? I think I did a number of times. And I'm pretty sure the first time I would have watched it was with him. But this this was a Christmas movie. I, mean, I don't know. In the UK, The Great Escape is a massive Christmas movie. So I think that's a very British thing. It's very British. And because the weather's so much better in Australia, yeah. we don't tend to spend hours watching movies. We're outside. Well, that's it. And, you know, nothing says Christmas like a POW camp in summer. You know, that, that's, re- that's Christmas, you know, and Boxing Day. I remember every Boxing Day, th- this movie was on. And I, I remember, I don't even think my mom has ever even really watched the whole movie, but she, it felt like she knew every line of dialogue. And that's my mom. And she wouldn't even consciously sit down and watch the movie. It's just, it's kind of built into the British fair, blood, you know? There's not that much dialogue. There's not a lot. There's and a lot, lot of the dialogue is incredibly iconic. Yeah. It's short, it's sharp, and it punches through the scene. I'll tell you something, right? So I did research this movie, and mm-hmm. I thought this was interesting, right? Because I was trying to think about how you categorize this movie, and I was reading a few interviews with the director. The director said that he never considered The Great Escape a war movie. Which I can't which makes no sense. It is set in the middle of World War II. Well, that's right. And, and, and I really like the way he put it, though. He said he didn't consider it a war movie, but rather a story that was just caused by the war. I think what he means is that, you know, you could set the movie at any time, right? You, the, you know, the, the escape of, a, of people out of a prison could be today. That's true. So I think what he's trying to say is that the idea is more universal. Yeah. yeah. A little bit like a love story or a love triangle is a universal idea. Correct, yeah. It, it was an interesting take on it, you know. Definitely in the UK, there's a very personal connection with this movie, I think. I think to people in the UK, it means quite a lot. And also represents kind of a, a simpler, nicer time of war, rather than the nasty, complex, grey morals of war that we have today. There is, there is a very clear good and evil in the movie, which I think people enjoy, right? People love that. Yeah. I think one of the other reasons why it's such an iconic British movie is this is predominantly a story, at least historically, about British P- POWs. So the Americans in real life only had one escapee. Right. And that was also because he was a British citizen. Right. So the Americans in this movie play a dominant part, even though there only seems to be three American actors. Yeah, so so right. So the idea is that they were never really the main people who drove the escape and actually so there's only one of them. There's right? only one of them. Right. And he's there because he's British. Right. Um, but partly why they don't drive it is Americans were involved, but they get moved into a different compound during the twelve months it took to build the tunnel. Yeah, right. And that was deliberate because the Germans decided to split the Americans and the British. And what I mean by British is also Commonwealth troops. Yeah. So Canadians, Aussies, Kiwis, and yeah. there were Dutch soldiers, French soldiers, a couple of Polish soldiers yeah. who fought with the British. I thought a lot more about where everyone came from mm-hmm. when I watched it this time, right? So I watched in The Great Escape and I'm kind of going, you know what? I'm going to focus on nationalities. Where Where is everyone from? And it is bloody confusing. Because apparently Charles Bronson, who plays the tunneling guy. Yes. Uh, Danny. Danny, right? the tunneling king. The tunneling king. So he's he's supposed to be Polish. Right, yes. So I think he's supposed to represent like all of like you know, mainland Europe or something. There's not many people well, from no, but Europe. You ha- but you right? have to remember there are a stack of Polish pilots who escaped to Britain and flew with the RAF mm. on the promise that at the end of the war, they would help Poland become independent. Right. 
So it does make sense because he was flying under the British flag. Yeah, true. And I feel like, I suppose it's good that they at least represent, I can't really tell he's Polish, Mel. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> like, I know he's got an accent and you're looking at him and going, Charles Bronson has an accent. Is it Polish? Like, I didn't but get Polish. can you Polish. tell me what a Polish accent sounds like? You know, I don't know what Polish is supposed to be. I I can't do a Polish accent, but I know for sure that Charles Bronson is not doing a Polish accent in this movie. Very sure of that. Did you know, just on the just on the nationality mm. stuff, because Americans are covered, the Brits are covered, we have one Polish person, which is good. James Coburn is supposed to be Australian. Yes. Did you know this when you wa- when you watched it previously? I did because they make it pretty clear, and he's got a really bad Aussie accent. He's got. Uh, I don't think it's Aussie. I think saying it's no, an Aussie it's accent. Cle- is being no, 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 kind. No. It's. I viewed it as what the Americans think an Aussie accent should have sounded like in World War Two. Right, yeah, okay, which is nothing like a Aussie accent, I suppose. But I, I never, honestly, I've watched this film maybe, maybe eight times, ten times, maybe. Mm-hmm. I've never picked up that he was supposed to be Australian until now. What? I've never no, really, uh, my brain never, knew. my brain never took it. I just was and like, I think it's because really? a couple of phrases he uses. It's the way he uses mate right. and a few others. I'm like, no other country uses those words in that way. And do you know how I picked it up this time, right? When he escapes, and we're jumping forward a little bit, but when he does go in the tunnel, when mm-hmm. the tunnel's ready, he's got his big suitcase. Ginormous suitcase. And someone says, someone kind of complains about the fact the suitcase is too big, and he says, I wish he was at home with his kangaroos. And I was like, kangaroo? And then it was only then that I was like, is that is that because he's supposed to be Australian? Is that is that? Yes. That's what that yes. means? It's almost like they thought, we need to just have a man say this just so we really indicate that's where he's from. But I'm glad they did that because I was confused. So uh, so he's Australian. So that's Australian, Polish, British, Americans. Do you know who's missing from this movie? Yeah, who's that? The Canadians. Okay. So in real life, there was well over 100 Canadians who participated in the whole logistics for The Great Escape. Right. So what you see in the movie is a, it, it feels like a reasonably small bunch of men involved. Yeah, but t- in real, tight group. Tight group. But in real life, there was actually about 600 Involved in the attempt. No, no, no. Not involved with the attempt that night, right. but involved in digging, yep. acting as stooges. So that means monitoring the Germans so they could raise the alarm if they were about to enter a specific hut. That's very good. You've got people involved in um, tailoring, so the suits. Yeah. You've got a large team involved in making forged documents. Mm. You've got people making compasses and maps and all sorts of stuff. It's a ton of work. It's a lot of work. I don't think you really realise how much work is in an escape. It is a lot of work, right? Now I have a question for you. Yeah. So this is a POW camp. Yeah. Why do these men have so much time to actually work on tunnelling? So this isn't a trick question. There's right. a legitimate reason why they had time. Is it? Right. Why did they have time? Right. Well, why? So think think about it. Who are these guys? So they're Air Force pilots, aren't they? They're from the- But be more specific. Are these just generic soldiers or are they- These are very articulate men. They're like- are they, Very well educated. Ah, right. So they're like, yeah. So they're like educated elitists they're type- officers. Oh, yes, of course. Right. And under the Geneva Convention, there are different rules for officers in comparison to just regular soldiers. And is that why the treatment of them is so nice? So obviously they're in- harsh conditions like they're not getting great food life's glim but compared to the treatment of your regular soldiers let alone how say the soviet prison of wars were treated oh i don't even want to think about that you really don't these guys had a much better standard so under the geneva convention you could compel officers to work but only the type of work that it was appropriate to their station right so that basically took out manual labor that's hilarious. And a whole bunch of other things. And so therefore they had time. I always find it amazing how the Germans were like, no, we've got to take this Geneva Convention really seriously because it fe- it feels like, because I, I couldn't believe how nice the camp is. Because, you know, I when you watch something like Schindler's List, and, and I'm just saying, you know, I'm picking this just because it is the kind of quintessential hard reality World War II movie, right? Very different point of view, very different, re- you know, kind of um, subject matter. But when you see the way Germans treat people, you just get the impression that if you're someone inside a prison, it doesn't even matter what prison it is, 
if you do something wrong or if you look at someone the wrong way, they will kill you immediately. Like there was that kind of uh, disregard for life. When I watch The Great Escape, I'm just absolutely stunned that um, these guys are given so much leeway. I mean, when... Um, when so the- there's a reason for that. Right, okay. So this camp, unlike your concentration camps or the death camps, are not run by the SS. Right. It's run by the Luftwaffe, so right. the Air Force. Yeah, so so very different um, division of their military, Completely right? Completely different division. Yeah. And let's say these guys had been part of the Army or the Navy, they also had their own camps. Yeah. So they enforce the standards that the Air Force thought was appropriate. Right. So as a general rule, and the other thing you have to remember is they viewed the British and the Americans very differently to how they viewed the Soviets. Right. In terms of how they treated them as human beings. And and there was a very, because you do get the impression, the level of respect that the, you know, the German army and air force officers, the Luftwaffe, they do have respect for the inmates. Right, because they it, do. It, yeah. there isn't they do respect life, you know, and I find it amazing that because I suppose at the beginning of the movie you have Ramsey, who's the senior British officer, and yep. he he's brought in to talk to um, Colonel von Luger, yes, who I can't say his name without a German accent because it's such a <laughs> wonderful name, and so Colonel von Luger he. You know, he gives a speech, which is the speech that you get at the beginning of every movie. And it's fantastic because it's basically him going, OK, you guys are dirt. All you do is escape. You've escaped everywhere. We've put you European in the backside. We have brought you here yep. to the inescapable, ultimate, super duper POW camp. Right. You're never getting out of here. And then he says stuff like, but don't worry, though, you're still going to get uh, recreation space. Uh, we're going to give you, you know, I don't know, showers. You're still going to have all this cool stuff. You no know, newspapers. Newspapers. Entertainment. Entertainment. Gardening. Library. Mm-hmm. I, he said library. I was like, library? And they really did have a library in the camp. That's crazy. I mean, they could have books in there about how but to remember, dig tunnels. these are officers. That's right. These aren't soldiers. The best part, though, is when he says, you know, and we will also give you tools for gardening, which I was kind of going like, I think the first thing you would do to stop someone escaping is just don't give them gardening tools. Oh, no, 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 no. This is important. So they had what they called the parole system in the camp, which meant they were given tools for legitimate purposes. Right. Under a gentleman's agreement, they would not use them as part of the escape. Oh, a gentleman's agreement. No, no, no. And the book that the movie is based on by Paul Brickhill makes it very clear that they never broke that parole system. Really? So they were given proper tools when they were, like, setting up the theatre. Those tools never got redeployed to actually the escape efforts. So the tools they made as part of that escape effort, they took things and reworked them. That's amazing. So they never actually used the gardening tools to dig. Correct. That's incredible. It really was. I I was so surprised how... Because when you're younger, you know, I never really understood what the reality of being a POW would be, Would be right? It's just an escape movie. It's a Hollywood movie. But watching it when I'm older, you do kind of put that lens on it. And you just feel like life in these camps was really nice. The whole movie's in summer. It doesn't even rain. Which is not movie. true. It's not true. I mean, it's sunshine, like 365. <laughs> I mean, they must have been digging for, how long did they dig for? For just under a year. So in real life, it was a year. I mean, that's ridiculous. And remember, they stopped and started depending on where the security risks changed. Yeah. Yeah, And you right. can only escape during certain times of the year. Like, the camp was in Poland. Right. It gets freezing in Poland. It's so There's cold. And it rains. No. It, it rains all the time, probably. Like, I was amazed. Like, it was so sunny all the time. During my research for the film as well, there's something that came up, at, especially at the beginning, while we're talking about the beginning, is, you know, they bring everybody into this camp, and it's the first time anyone's been in there before. Mm-hmm. There's this beautiful camera shot where, you know, it starts at a high angle and showing the prisoners walking in, and then it dives down, and then the fence of the barbed wire falls into the foreground in front of the audience's face. And the nice thing is that, you know, you see the fence, but you also see this massive tree line Mm. and it's just pine trees, isn't it? It's just, and when they made the movie, one of the most important things for them was to have this kind of, kind of dense line of pine trees surrounding the whole camp. And it's really clever because basically the idea behind it is that it's supposed to be, you're in a prison, you see the prison fence and then beyond the prison fence, there's almost like there's another fence 
blocking you from the outside world. So it's almost like the the pine trees and the, you know they're so dense you can't see anything through there. It's almost like there's a prison within a prison. It is, and it acts as a, a second secondary mechanism because you don't know what's beyond those trees. Yeah, that's right. So you have no sense of like, let's say the train station, is it five miles or is it fifty miles away? You have no idea. Yeah, it's very clever. And when you see the camera swoop down, you really get that. You can see that you cannot see anything. You are locked in. You're locked in and it feels claustrophobic. Like you feel like you're like, you're really, oh God, I'm really, you know, done in with this. But um, but the title card at the beginning, it does say every detail of this escape is the way it really happened. And I suppose I'd ask you, you know, you know, from your point of view, you don't have to go through it, obviously, you know, all at once, but... So a lot to unpack, but generally speaking, in terms of how they did it, um, does it ring true? Yeah, there's a lot of detail in it that is very true. There are bits and pieces that are not, but I think what I would say is the essence of it is true. Yeah, right. So the fact that they really believed in this idea of setting up a second front to Mm. pull as many Germans away from fighting as possible to look for these guys. And and the German commanders are quite nice to the to the prisoners as well a lot of the time I, like there's never a sense of i never find there is a sense of oppression in the movie i guess it, you never feel like they're they're like i mean the worst thing that happens to them is they they kind of close the shutters of their rooms and tell them you know to lock them in that, that's like the, the worst cooler gas well the cooler is that that's true the cooler is but even the cooler You're in isolation sometimes for weeks that is true and it and it is you know, it is quite bad. And when you think about the reality- There's of, no beds in there. There's no, no beds. toilets. And 20 days is what Steve McQueen's ca- Hilt's character is, um, you know, sentenced to, right? And he gets 20 days at the beginning for obviously- What was it? What was the reason he gets 20 days? So he I, goes across that um piece of wire that's kind of at knee Oh, that's right. Because he yeah. want to test the blind spot. That's right. Because there's, there's a blind spot between the two guard towers. He's going to- Which is based on a true story. Two right. of the guys who were actually POWs had a theory about that and did test it out during the escape plans and that's, it was true it's interesting as re- it, yeah it, you could see why it might work as well and and so yeah he goes i think with, with ives the scottish he does guy go with ives for 20 but it days. nearly destroys ives well it does destroy ives because in the end he gets so desperate he climbs up the fence and gets shot well, well that's right and, and he's kind of i mean th- th- this is the thing mel you know it's it makes sense that in the american movie the american guy is super handsome you know, piercing blue eyes, you know, has a full head of hair. I mean, he looks great. And then like the Scotsman is like a five foot one guy. He's partially Jockey. balding, you know, and it's just like, and he's cracking under the pressure. And I just was like, this is such an American movie. You know, I imagine a lot of Scotsmen watch and go, oh, come on, you know, but, um, but you, you know, 20 days is nothing to, you know, laugh at. It's a long time. And I guess, you know, as the only thing about this movie, I do wish if you did it differently, if you did it today, you would have to show how difficult, at least in some short way, you know, in some cinematic way, you'd have to give an impression of how difficult 20 days would be on the brain, right? Because yeah. it's so, for Steve McQueen's character, it's washed away immediately, really. Well, that's part of the American psyche of the hero. Yeah. It's like, it he's doesn't even bother him. He's self-sacrificing. He's got, his, as long as he's got his baseball mitt and the baseball, he's good to go. It is. It, it's like a, and he has obviously got a huge mental fortitude. You know, the whole idea is that, you know, he can't be broken in the movie really, but 20 days is brutal, you know, and he does come out after that. I mean, a bit dazed. A bit dazed and, you know, he doesn't know what's going on. It's surprising to me though, right? Steve McQueen's the highest build in the movie. He's mm-hmm. the star of the movie and he spends most of the bloody movie inside the cooler. He does. And and you're talking about, you know, he's not interacting with other actors. He doesn't even really, he doesn't hatch the plan. The plan isn't his idea. It's completely ran from um, the British officer side with so Richard Attenborough. With, well, yes, Roger, big X. But that is also based on what happened in real life. Like mm. it was always a British plan and yeah. a plan that was ultimately implemented by the British and the Commonwealth POWs. Yeah, of course. And I guess it, you could see why, though, they might be annoyed then, right? Because we, you know, the whole American British thing, you know, the Americans are center stage. They're the best looking in the movie. They're clearly the, you know, they're, they're the stars. They, they are the stars. They're and the stars. They're the eye candy. I could argue Richard Attenborough, he should be nearly the main guy in the movie, nearly. I, I feel like he, he should be. And he is in the book. Right. He's the star. Because see, that makes sense to me because it's clear that they're trying to rebalance it in the movie. He's also the leader. He is. It makes sense that the leader is the star. And he gives the most inspiring speeches. You know, he's the strongest. He's the, 
you know, he's got the most mental fortitude to keep going, even when it's hard and everybody starts kind of breaking a little bit. And it seems like all the other characters have their weaknesses, but he doesn't, though. He's actually, even in the face of, you know, issues that happen, he's very good at making decisions. He's a perfect leader. I did find so it you interesting. you say that he's perfect. Ramsey does question him at the beginning of the movie about whether he's doing this for the right reasons. Because remember, before the movie starts, he spends some time with the Gestapo. That's right. And there is a suggestion of well, it, how were you treated? Are you okay? Yeah. Are you doing this out of revenge? And what kind of risks are you taking? And the book also hints at that. So there is a bit of a question about what is driving Roger. Yeah, I, it's a very good point. And I remember Ramsey, his, the senior British officer, does say to him at some point, like, everyone knows who you are, right? It, the, the entire Gestapo knows who you are. The whole SS knows who you are. Yeah. The moment you leave the prison, it's kind of useless because we're, they're going to pick you up. But because of the other prisoners are not as well known, they don't have as much notoriety, they may get away from it. They're more likely to get undetected. Uh, you know, when I was younger, I always thought the whole point to escape is just to get home, right? Because nobody wants to be at war. It's just to get home. But actually but the point they're of- They're adults. They knew most when they're going to get home. Well, that's right. They always knew that. And, and the dark part is that it's not really about getting home, is it? The, the whole point of trying to escape is simply to disrupt the enemy. Yep. And inflict I, as much damage as humanly possible. I never, it never registered with me when I was younger, but I thought that was interesting, you know, that they're actually doing what their duty is. It's more like it's duty rather than a desperation. And the movie does talk about that, that it is the sworn duty of officers to try and escape. Mm, that's right. And, and you can't take it easy just because you're in a POW camp. You have to push the enemy. You have to have, you know, the idea of that make the enemy have to guard you with more men. Immediately, as soon as these guys go into the camp, they're trying to escape. Like, they like, are. Like and you, instantaneously. And you see that it's what they call as escape fever. You've got guys jumping into trucks under trees. You've got guys um, trying to walk out with Russian POWs. That's right. So they're taking pickaxes, coats, little hats on, trying to walk out, learning one phrase of Russian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, most of that is totally true. So right. when they arrived at the camp, they did have what they called escape fever. So like it's a real thing, right? It's so like, they, like, like a desperation. To desperation. But it's partly desperation, but it's also partly them testing the limitations of the camp and the new staff. Right. What can we get away with? How switched on are they? Yeah, it, it, testing the boundaries. Intel. Yeah, yeah. How, how good are they? How aware of what's going on? But also what on? are the consequences if you do something wrong? Yes. Because then you can make better judgment calls about the level of risk you're willing to take. Oh, of course, just after this, Bartlett comes into the camp. He is obviously the, the British officer that has the idea, the drive to manage and attempt to get what he says is 250 men. Which is huge. It's huge. They'd had attempts before, but most of their attempts had been about, say, 20 people. And even I was thinking the reality of 250 men, I mean, it must have sounded lunacy to some of these guys. What doing else did it. they have to do? And to dig, and he wants to dig, so he has it, you know, within five minutes of being in the camp, he already has a plan. And the plan is to dig three separate three tunnels. Three tunnels, simultaneously, yeah. Tom, Dick, and Harry. Yeah, and so he's, you know, talking about this, and you get the impression that everybody's just going, this is crazy. This is absolutely outrageous. And I don't even know why you would dig three tunnels, but I guess the point is if you if one gets captured or found out, you still have another one. Is that That's kind of that's the idea. That's exactly it. Yeah, right. And to do it, you know... Obviously, you, you have to recruit everyone. Everybody has to be part of the plan. No, no, no. So that's the key part is people were involved, but a lot of them didn't know any details. Right. Or certainly any substantial detail to maximize secrecy. The last thing you want is to have everyone know everything. And then if something happens and they get taken away or, or they let it slip, right. you're busted. Yeah, on a need-to-know basis. Very much so. Yeah. And a classic one is Tom, Dick, and Harry were obviously code names. But Big X threatened to court-martial anyone who ever referred to them as tunnels. Right. So that discipline and secrecy was just paramount. And the, even the language is very important as well. Because, again, if you're just casually, comfortably talking about this stuff at the side of your hut or something, I mean, that's a dangerous thing. You, very dangerous. You can't have that. Because I think the first tunnel they start digging... And as this is happening, Steve McQueen and the uh, five foot one Scottish guy, Ives. Ives, they plan their own escape. 
They do. Which is, uh, you know, them going to the blind spot between the two towers and digging their way out during the night. The badgering. The badger. Is that With what it's called? Little, yeah, they, well, I, don't, I don't think it was badgering, but that they were going to act name. like badgers. Yeah, badgers, yeah. And Ooh. then use these little poles for air holes. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. And that's how they breathe as they get out. It's, um, I, I just, yeah. So it's funny how, you know, separate Steve McQueen is to it all. To be honest, he really is kind of outside of the realm. So then I have a question for you. Yeah. If he's so desperate and it doesn't look like he's involved with one single shift of digging. Yeah, he's not. Why is he the front digger he who digs the entrance to the top on the night of the escape? It's true. It, it's absolutely true. Yeah, it's, it makes it, no sense. It doesn't make any sense. And actually, the level of respect that Steve McQueen gets when he eventually says to you know the British, yes, I want to be part of your great tunnel escape thing, they go, oh yeah, of course. Of course, it comes at a price because he does have to give, give them some intel. He does, but, and, but, he, and he he deliberately escapes, get the intel, and then gets recaptured incredibly quickly. Yeah. So he does have that intel. It, it, it's in, And he does give them something, but you're right. I mean, he, he and he becomes the main character in the last third of the movie, and it, which is a little un- unbalanced. Steve McQueen, though, just to look at him in, at, as where he is in the movie, I think the reason it fits him so well particularly is because I don't think he'd be very good playing a character that's part of a group. Right, because well, no, he's got this bad boy image. That's right. He, you know, he, he's a lone wolf. He's a lone wolf. He's the outsider. You know, he's the rebel. You know, so the thing is, is that it's almost almost a weakness for him that if he was part of a group that was all doing the one thing and he just kind of agreed with everybody and stuff, I he wouldn't stand out. I think it's clear he, he would have taken that role because he is different. He is on the outskirts. He is, you know, a man alone. It is. But the movie wasn't initially designed that way. Yeah. So as you know, they had no completed script. Mm. And a, a lot of the dialogue and how they just rearranged the plot, they kept rearranging it. And my understanding is Steve McQueen was very demanding about his role. He didn't like certain aspects of it. They That's changed right. it. Yeah, absolutely and true. And in essence, it was because he wanted to be seen as more of a hero. No doubt Steve McQueen was quite a selfish actor to be quite honest and he was very good at knowing what worked for him oh he's no ensemble actor not not at all all. no and and he never you know if you look at actors some actors will perform for the benefit of a movie but richard attenborough exactly point exactly steve mcqueen was the opposite you know richard attenborough would do whatever probably it took whatever the director said and do it his best because that's what would make the movie good but he would also change himself to balance out the other actors in the scene. So whether they were more inexperienced or like loud or soft or whatever needed to be done, he would change himself to make the scene work. That's very good. Yeah. And and Steve McQueen is the opposite, right? Because he was, you know, it it's was about, about him. him. It's about him. And that's his real weakness nearly as well. He's great. But he does have, he has something though. And the something is whatever the X factor is about being a Hollywood star. Well, whatever you need to be charismatic visually on film, he has that. Oh, he definitely does. Because he, because he, there's something, he's got the piercing eyes, you know, he does have that James Dean, you know, anti-authoritarian stuff. There is something that he has that you can see why when they looked at Steve McQueen, they thought that he's got it. Do you know what it is? I think at the fact that he's not in control. Mm. He's a little bit wild and it's that untameness that is alluring. Yeah. It's unpredictability, maybe, right? You don't know whether he's going to kill you. Or, or shake your hand. Yeah, right. He's incredibly loyal to Ives. He so is, when Ives is climbing that fence, he knocks over the German who wants to shoot him to give them more time to pull him back. That's right. He didn't have to do that. The truth about Steve McQueen is that his range of emotion is very limited. He was probably very lonely, or certainly that character would have been very lonely. Mm, very true. He, he's he's very interesting. Like he, it is true. Um, James Garner called Steve McQueen an action actor, and I think what he meant by that is that if you had Steve McQueen on a bike, brilliant. If you had him on a boat, on a bus, on a car, on a racetrack, if, even if you had him running after someone or walking down the street, he was the best actor to have. He he was brilliant at that. But I think also what he meant on the other side of that coin is. That when it came to emotions, extensive dialogue, maybe, you know, subtextual stuff, right? You know, when you're saying dialogue, but you mean something else, or if you're in a romantic scene and you're, you know, you're not saying what you think. He's interesting. So he he worked with John Sturges three years before. So he works on The Magnificent Seven. 
And in The Magnificent Seven, that was the first real movie role that he had that was significant. Um, before that, he worked with John Sturgis on a, on a very small role with Frank Sinatra, Never So Few. But when he gets the Magnificent Seven role, it's a big break for Steve McQueen's career. And what's interesting is that when he got the part, Yul Brenner is the star of that movie. Yul Brenner is top billed. He won Yul Brenner just won the Oscar for The King and I, um, won the best actor. Great movie. Great movie. He's terrific in a he's brilliantly cast. He's very charismatic, Yul Brenner, and Steve McQueen is his backup. Now Steve McQueen doesn't like this. No, he at, wouldn't at all. And at the time, Steve McQueen's on a Western show, um, Wanted Dead or Alive. And when he acts with Jewel Brenner in The Magnificent Seven, Steve McQueen has a very specific strategy in order to draw the audience's eye to him and not Jewel Brenner. And this was very well known that he was doing this when he was filming every scene. He's just being a dick. He's being a dick. And he's very good at being a dick, apparently, because really he... Steve McQueen was a, a master manipulator of filmmaking situations. He was very clever at this. And so what he would do when Yul Brenner would be doing a dialogue scene of some sort, he would take his hat off. Steve McQueen would be next to him. He would take his hat off. He would kind of twirl his hat in his hands. In some scenes, he's even unbuckling his gun belt and then buckling it back on or twirling his gun in his hand. And he did this all the time. And the whole idea was to try and almost undermine the audience's eye so that when Yul Brenner was... Constant distractions. So they're not actually right. listening to that dialogue. Yeah. It, Why didn't the director pick up on that? Well, they did. They actually told him. So uh, Sturgis... Stop doing it. Yeah, Sturgis knew this was happening. He could see it. Um, Yul Brenner also knew. So there's a couple of scenes in the movie. I watched The Mechanism of Seven recently. There is a few scenes where you can literally see Yul Brenner look at him and he's doing it, which I'm kind of going... He definitely was just going, dude, dude, just don't do this. You know, I'm trying to get the dialogue out, you know? Um, and and he, he did this all the time. And it's I don't think it's a mistake that when The Magnificent Seven comes out, people remember him. Steve McQueen is the guy that people really, it, it made him, it really did. So how do we feel about a guy playing a hero who is a douche in real life? As in Steve McQueen? Yeah, like does yeah. it take away from him being a hero? Because when I watch it as an adult, I don't view him as as how I did when I was a child. Like when I was a child, I was like, this guy is a rock star. Yeah. Now I just see him as a insecure, selfish man. And he was that, you know. I think that's a sad thing. You know what? You're right. The more you read about Steve McQueen or watch about him, he does fit that profile. He he was not that cool guy. He was an alpha male. He was super competitive. He was super competitive. That's why I enjoyed racing, I think, because he ne- if he seen someone better, at something and he considered himself good at that, he had to be better than you. It didn't matter what it took. Which is inherently insecure. Very insecure, very insecure. And he was incredibly competitive. There's a story that uh, James Garner and Donald Pleasance tells about Steve McQueen where he le- he left the Great Escape set for what is apparently six weeks, which is a long time. And, and these days you'd be sacked for that. Oh, completely. And, th- and you have to remember, Steve McQueen wasn't a AAA star in 1963. No, he, he's still climbing. He's still climbing. The Great Escape is probably what tips him over into international stardom because of the bike, you know, chase at the end. All about the bike scene. All about the bike scene. That really made him, I think, you know, his, his wife, his and first again, wife. no dialogue. That. No dialogue. It's very action oriented. I mean, the most he does is stare off into the distance maybe four or five times. It's That's it. He's great at that. He was a genius at doing that. And he left the set for six weeks because he had read the number of uh, lines of dialogue that James Garner had, who was his competition, young American actor, you know, his co-star. And And a much more interesting character. And a better actor, to be frank. Yes. I mean, on paper, better actor, Um, you know, more emotional range, quite honestly. James Garner is a trained actor, you know. And it's and interesting willing to sacrifice, like the way he says to Colin, I will get you out because Colin's lost his sight. So he believes in self sacrifice, camaraderie. It's about the bigger picture, not just about me being number one. That's right. And, and he's, he's involved. I mean, you could say um, his character's essential because the scrounger, James Garner's uh, role in the escape is, you know, he has to get all the tools, camera, he's got to get the the clothes, IDs, you know, he's got to get all of that. It's an incredibly important role. 
And he's also really good at it and he manipulates the German guard and he's got all those scenes of trying to, you know, you know, manipulate him by giving him chocolate. A little bit of blackmail. Blackmail. It's it's very fun. You can see why Steve McQueen would have read all that complexity and seen the dialogue that he had. And apparently because he had more dialogue, he he literally walked off the set for six weeks and demanded that the script was rewritten to include him more. And I think, although I've never read this for sure, I'm quite sure that the reason why they have this kind of strange plot device where they need to know where the train station is. And because they don't know where the train station is, they get McQueen to actually escape with the wire cutters, very simply. Don't know why he didn't do that the first time. It's actually based on a true story. Okay. So they really did need to get some more intel about how far the forest went. I'm proven wrong. And so they did actually have a POW who did escape and came back. It did happen. Oh, I thought I had that. (laughs) I thought I had a Mel. But but I feel like... I don't know where but it didn't have to be Steve. It didn't have to be Steve. It could have been someone else. But I feel like they definitely did something with him around that area to to enhance. And also, the bike chase was his idea. I think it was Steve McQueen's idea. But they definitely wrote it in the movie to keep him happy. Oh, of course, there was no there's no bike motorcycle chase. chase in the real Great Escape. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, I'd imagine that like that was not part of the book. I imagine it's an extensive motorcycle chase in Bavaria. Yeah. It um it's a very Steve McQueeny addition to the movie and yeah I, Let, let's talk about it's, that it's a bit pathetic because it's cool it is very cool and you know in hindsight you know you think oh he he shouldn't have demanded to have that in the movie right you should never have done that but it actually makes the movie it you need it the scene itself there's no punches I think he kicks one German away that's right he, he cycles on some roads through some fields etc what makes that scene interesting is the pull of freedom literally being on the other side of that two wide fences because yeah, that's right. Switzerland on the other side. The proximity of nearly getting there but missing by like, what are we talking, That's inches. why you care. That's why you care. It's, it's very it's true. It's not that he just jumped over a wire fence. We've had hundreds of movies that have done things like that and we don't care in the same way. Very true. Very true. And you're, you're dead right. It's almost because the audience can feel freedom but he can't get there. And he's caught in the wire and you really do feel the sense of like, oh, so close. So close. It, you feel that heartbreak for him. It's a great scene. He always struggled with them um, because, you know, the, they didn't let Steve McQueen do the No, the jump. they did not. He's, but, one of his best mates did it. Yeah, Bud Eakins, I think, did it. He was a stunt man. That was his first movie and he did the bike jump. One of the reasons Steve McQueen was so famous from The Great Escape too is because I think that people really thought that he did the jump, you know, and so he had to spend a lot of time with people kind of admitting that it wasn't him. It was it was his friend, Bud Eakins, who built all the bikes for the movie as well. But Steve McQueen, to be fair, did also put on helmets and do some of the shooting for the German soldiers on other bikes. Oh, yeah. So he was involved with other aspects aspects of that scene. Yeah. But what I don't understand is why TV shows or whoever were doing these interviews would have thought it would be actually him when they know in Hollywood the stars never get to do actually dangerous stunts. This is true. Because he was such an alpha male, you know, it would have hurt. It did hurt him slightly to have to admit that because he is the kind of person that would have wanted to take credit for being the guy that did the stunt that no one else did or that no other actor in, in the cast would have done. Very because, much so. Because he's a competition. You know, he really does see himself in competition with James Garner and Rich Attenborough mm. and all these other guys. And he he probably knows they're way better actors than of him. Of course he does. He, he knows that. So that's why he needs something else. To, to stand out, right? Stand out, to contrast yeah. in the way he can compete. Yeah, it's very true. He gets the bike by putting a piece of wire across the road. I always thought to myself, you know, what if a truck comes? You know, or but he knew the bike was coming. Like he, he, he looks have... in advance. You can see him look, and that's when he puts the wire across. Okay, I never got that, but okay, maybe. And other movies do that. In one of the Indiana Jones movies, Harrison Ford also did that trick to get uh, a German bike. He did do, didn't he? Yeah, that's right. I remember that. It was a fantastic scene, and it's actually it's lucky that they actually. Um, they, you know, because he needed a finale. If the finale of the movie is just a bunch of people escaping and then getting shot, it's not enough, is it? It's especially in the type of. Is it not enough because we know it? Like, I wonder if that's actually true. Mm, if we if we ha- if we got rid of it and it was just yeah, you could be right. They probably would have extended the suspense between people going through train stations and, you know, extended those. Well, things they would slightly. have had more time to flesh out how the other characters escaped. 
Yeah. Because it's so much Steve McQueen dominant, you don't have time. It's very quick, actually. And the movie is two hours, 45 minutes. It's long. It's a long movie. And you're right. It's funny. They get out of the camp from memory at the two hour mark. And I suppose this is what makes me think of why it's a Christmas movie is that it is really tragic, right? The whole idea of the movie is that it's a real tragic end. 50 died. 50 died. But I never feel like it's a, a sad movie for some reason. I don't know. Do you feel that? No, I don't. But I think that's part of the point of the movie is it's not about succeeding. It's actually about trying. And then if you fail, you try again. That is the underlying message of the movie. Yeah, of course. You have a duty to keep going. Yeah. I um, I do want to go back to the tunneling, mm-hmm, mind you. Because please. Obviously, they're, they're got the three tunnels. Mm-hmm. Now, here's the thing, though. I remember because they get Danny, Charles Bronson. Charles Bronson's tough guy. Tunnel King. Tunnel King. This guy could dig his way out of anything, right? He is a digger. And so... Nearly doesn't make it. Well, I tell you, you know, that's true. Mental what, health. And I think in some ways he and Ives provide kind of the most honest... Struggling. Sh- struggling. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. I, and to be honest, that's one thing the movie probably needs more of, actually, is probably the struggle. Because I, I... I assumed that was deliberate. So you yeah. would have had a whole lot of... Veterans watching this movie. It's not that long after World War II. It was really. less, less than 20 years. You've got a whole lot of wives, sisters, daughters who, husbands, brothers, whatever, may have not come back. Yeah. They're not ready then to have a really honest discussion about it. Right. I've never really considered that, but you're right. So they, they don't want to see the harsh realities of war. They want to see a slightly Hollywoodized version of it. Maybe. It needs to be safe. I could, I could understand that, yeah. I suppose also they're thinking people aren't going to pay tickets to see the horrors of war, right? The last thing you don't want as the film company is to create a movie which triggers a vet's trauma. Mm, and be remembered for that. That's horrific. It's very tough. So you need to play it much safer. That's a good reason as to why there's not more struggle. Because I think now, if you made this movie today, it would be nearly essential to show the level of struggle and work it would take to actually do. Because honestly, to dig the tunnels that they dig, the amount of energy you would have to, you know, and give to that. they weren't on good diets. No. Diets were horrendous. And no one goes hungry in the movie, which is a slight criticism. You know, they're all, they seem pretty, uh, they're all in sausages they and chips. They look very healthy. They're very good looking guys. They, they look good. And I timed this. I should let you know, right? So 40 minutes in. Charles Bronson starts digging the tunnel, right? And that is him. And I literally looked at it and I was like, that looks difficult because it's basically them moving the um, heater and there's a, there's a slab of concrete and he's got a pickaxe and he just starts smashing it. And they, they time it to some guy smashing a thing outside so the Germans can't tell by sound. And I looked at it and I was like, that's going to take a while. Did you not notice the muscles? He has a lot of muscles. He was a, he was a muscular guy. But remember, in real life, they were working on shifts. Mm. There were stacks of guys involved with digging the tunnels. Well, you'd have to be. And they were also digging them. I mean, remember, they stopped at various times, but they were digging them on and off for about a year. But the thing is, is that, you know, you, it makes it seem like Charles Bronson did this on his own, which I kind of go, Jesus, look how much work that would be. I know, you, I know that's you know not th- true. But not just that, and maybe you're forgetting – Remember when the tunnel collapses on him and his mate pulls him out by the ankles? Yeah, there is the other guy. Yeah, that's He's, right. So there's at least two in the movie. That's true. Who are digging. There's at least two people. He has help. So he has one guy helping him. 300 feet a tunnel, one other guy. No, but like, but the, look, in 40 minutes, he starts digging and I looked at him and I was like, man, that's going to take a while. 48 minutes in, he he's already, not only has he got through the concrete, he's already created an entire atrium that allows four people to s- sit in. And just kind of chill out. I was I was amazed. It took eight no minutes. One wants to do it. To, no one wants to watch a movie that shows how slow and painful it is to tunnel. I, I guess that's, that's true. That's dull. That's dull. But like, I'm I'm still going. Like, man, you know, this would be incredibly difficult. It would be incredibly difficult. They got time. Maybe my problem is that they you don't get the indication that time is. You know, I feel like literally eight minutes later, you know, that, you know, suddenly we've got a a significant tunnel with a real system. Part of that, I think, is also the weather doesn't change throughout the movie. That's a problem. So you don't get that sense of this has been going on for months and months. I 
think if they hadn't changed the weather, if they sorted the weather out, I think you'd buy it better. I, th- I think that'd be better. But I'm assuming they filmed the movie over a pretty short period of time. Yes, that's right. I think, so they filmed it in Bavaria. So the, it was interesting. The, the film was originally supposed to be filmed in California. Uh, there's not many pine trees in California. California does look a little bit different to Poland. Well, you know why? Because it's California. That's why it's a, it's a problem. So also th- there actually was a reason they went to Germany as well. Apparently the Screen Extras Guild had some sort, they didn't give them concessions because they needed loads of extras. It was a movie mm. where because of, because of the fact they're in a POW camp and there's like, what, well, eight million characters and they have tons of extras around them. They needed to hire extras constantly. And in order to get away with this, they found it cheaper in Germany to do such things. And so that's why they moved it to Germany. Germany also has pine trees, and they did everything in Germany. They did the interiors of the movie in the in the Bavarian uh, studio. And uh, yes, and the camp was completely built, like life-size, like everything was totally built there. Labor was cheap. Labor was cheap. And so it, it, I think it's great. It's a great choice that they actually did it there. This brings me to the one cliche, uh, two cliches of this movie that, not to bug me, but I do find it a little funny. Number one cliche, of course, is back to Charles Bronson, who plays the digger. Now, I am not an expert on digging. I don't claim that I would know what to do if I had to dig a 300-foot tunnel. That is not an expertise that I would be able to uh, to be involved in. But I'm sure being claustrophobic is something that you should probably tell people about. I just find the fact that the guy that digs a tunnel ends up being the claustrophobic one, it kind of is a bit strange. And I don't know whether he developed claustrophobia because he dug tunnels or because he always had it. So there is a scene in cho- the movie that talks about it. And, and he chose the wrong career path. There's a scene in the movie where the mate who he escapes with asks, he's like, you're a tunneler, how can you be afraid of small spaces? And he talks about it. Right. But in essence, I think a big part of it is, is just constant exposure to this trauma. Yeah, right. And for a lot of people, once you get to a certain threshold, you can't handle it anymore. You just can't do it. And I do get, you know, the idea that, you know, if he spent so much time in there and he's had the cave-ins as well, which to be honest, Many. terrifying, absolutely terrifying. I guess that's, the, and I that couldn't that. whole that. sequence of them pulling them out by their ankles to get them out when the, the caves, when the tunnels caved in, that's literally how they pulled them out. That's horrible. Yeah. So I, I could see that. So, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll forgive that. Uh, that's, that's cliche number one. Cliche number two, this is my last complaint. Uh, the, the film's wonderful. Donald Pleasance. He is a photographer and a bird watcher and a dr- and a bird drawer. So this is Colin, Colin, the forger who goes blind. That's right. And I just felt that like all his hobbies are specifically visual. So it kind of makes sense that if we we need him to be blind, we need we need conflict. Let's make the guy that's a bird watcher and the photographer. Let's get him blind, and then dramatic conflict ensues, and tragedy is you know thoroughly underlined. Which I think is a point of the movie is that this shouldn't just be about the fit and the healthy or only deserving of the chance to escape. That message is very positive, by the way. Yes, And and, and I think it's a really important one that we have a duty to look after our vulnerable, not just our success stories. And I think when you've got Steve McQueen being such a dominant part, that contrast with Colin throughout the movie, I actually think is really important. That is true. You know, you've convinced me. That Thank I've you. completely been uh, shot down. No, no, it's, it's honestly really good. And actually, I like the scenes. Like he, he's terrific, by the way. I think you feel for him emotionally more. Do you than know anyone. he was also a POW in one of the German camps? He was. He was. I actually, I'm. We did the same research. I think on this, we with, should with talk about this. Article. Actually, yeah, we should talk about this. Um, Can we actually talk about the escape? Yeah, of course. So the actual night of the escape with the tunneling. Yeah, because. It's actually even more dramatic in real life than in the movie. So, for example, before they even go down the tunnel, the entrance into the tunnel had frozen. Oh, wow. And it took them an extra hour than was planned to actually open it up to get even guys down there. They made the decision to leave the morning of that night. Right. And the reason why they did that was they needed to date stamp all the forged documents. And so what they did was they created a stamp with the heel of a boot 
Right. And then literally stamped all the documents. Yeah. But they had to wait until the weather started to thaw because there's still snow on the ground. So this is March. It's cold. Not only that, this was the coldest March in 30 years. Wow. So we're talking, they say that some of the areas had up to five feet of snow. God, that's cold. It's really cold, which so, explains so actually, so why the when, entrance froze. Yeah, so they so when they actually escaped in real life, it was snow everywhere. Snow everywhere. Wow. It was freezing. That would have been. You see, I actually think that's probably more dramatic, really, than the way the movie did. I actually think that would have been. Re- they probably, for financial reasons, wouldn't have been able to do the snow, but like it would have visually, that would look really incredible. I do find it so. The and the inciting reason in the movie for why they decide to go is I think it's isn't it made on Independence Day? It's a very American thing, but they celebrate Independence Day in the camp, right? But they did actually celebrate July 4th. Did they? So the American soldiers actually did make alcohol, but it wasn't with potatoes. Okay, so it wasn't like moonshine potato alcohol. No, what they did was they used raisins. Oh. So they had what they called raisin wine. And so they collected a stack of raisins from their Red Cross parcels. They used sugar and then they kind of fermented them. And then the sophisticated ones double distilled it. Right. So they had a whole collection of this stuff. And then on 4th of July, they had a bit of a party. I do like, you know, because I I was watching them take all the potatoes and, you know, because in the movie they make uh, like potching or, you know, moonshine. They're taking all the potatoes and nobody knows why they're taking the potatoes. It's a mystery in the movie until later you realize they're brewing alcohol. And I was thinking to myself, maybe do they need those potatoes to eat? Because, you know, they might need. They're definitely short on rations, but nowhere in the book talks about them eating potatoes. Okay. Okay. And they they probably grew the potatoes themselves. Well, I'm not sure they did grow potatoes. I don't know either. Yeah, I'm confused. I'm thinking, where are all these? And there's a lot of potatoes, you know. Which, but, which is why it doesn't really quite work. It doesn't really work. But I think my favorite scene is definitely when James Garner, Steve McQueen and the other guy are tasting the moonshine and they're like, this is good. Apparently it took forever to film that scene. Really? Because they needed to spend time saying this is good in different ways from each other. Right. Uh, and yes. so they spent... I suspect days playing around with those dynamics. I'm surprised Steve McQueen didn't f- fit in a few extra lines for himself in that scene. It's great. It's a really funny scene. Yeah, and he actually, doesn't like dialogue. It's the perfect scene for him. Yeah, true, true. He's very, he's a subtle reactor. You know? his, his longest speech in the movie, I'm pretty sure, is, is when Richard says to him, we're going to get 200 out. And he does that double take and then he goes, you're crazy, you ought to be locked up oh, and so like, should you. 250 yeah. or something like that's that. That's his longest speech in the movie. That's, that's And it's funny. really short. It is really short, yeah. I, I never thought about that. He doesn't have anything to, because um, compared to Richard Attenborough, Richard Attenborough has, you know, lengthy Even James monologues. Garner has lengthy scenes of dialogue. I really do love his relationship with Donald Pleasance. It, 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 is, re- it is the heart. Yeah, it's he what and it, Colin have a beautiful relationship. Yeah, it's such a great, and also because they're so different. You know, he, he, Colin's very sensitive. He he wasn't even a real... Well, he was interpreting intelligence, decided to go up with one of the rides to get some real life experience and then got shot down. Yeah, just doing an internship. You know, I'm not even, I'm not even supposed to do work today. And considering, you know, James Garner's the, you know, the man of mano American hero, it's a great relationship. There's a sensitivity to that relationship that I think nothing else in the film really has. The, the triggering incident, of course, is um, the Germans finding Tom... And then I believe Bartlett kind of says, right, we've got to go. Clearly what they say is we need to work on Harry 24-7 to get moving. So ah, they speed yes. things up. You're right. But it's not the next day. Right. Because well, it takes time. Of course it takes time. They've got a date stamp, like 400 documents. They're still making uniforms. They also need to make sure that it's there's no moon. Right. Because they're escaping in the snow and the snow reflects the moon and the stars, it looks really bright at night. Right, So of you course. can't escape if you've got a big moon. Makes sense. Yeah, absolutely makes sense. It- and the movie talks a little bit about, especially for Steve McQueen's earlier attempt about when are you going and they talk about moonless nights. Yeah. Well, it makes sense, I guess. And that's, that's a really great detail because they would have had to have thought this in advance because if they... You know, if they're seen and the moon's reflecting everything, they're going to be caught yeah. immediately, right? I love the fact that the movie really goes into a bit of detail about how difficult communication is through the tunnels. Because if you're at the top of the tunnel and you realize that they're 10 feet short, whatever it is. They are. And that is based on true story. They are short. Which is dramatically perfect because if it worked, you know, you, no plan in Hollywood can go to plan, right? It has to have something That's wrong. It's a bit dull. Yeah, a bit of conflict, you know. So, like, they're 10 feet short. Steve McQueen knows this. He's at the front. 
Uh, Bartlett, Richard Attenborough is there with him. He is. McDonald's with him as well. And then the thing is, you know, every time someone comes up the tunnel, they got to explain to them again. The tunnel is short. The tunnel is short. I got, and they have to do this every time. But remember, these are military men. They are used to that. Right. So you would remember at the par- military, at the parade at the very end, when they announce how many have been shot, mm. you see them do the Chinese whispers down the lines because the people at the end can't hear anything. That's right. So they are very well trained at that. And, and I like that th- there's a detail where um, the senior British officer, Ramsey, he, he's not even in the tunnel. And he, no, and that would be a conflict of his duties. Right. And I, I love the fact that he just kind of goes, why haven't we left yet? Like, why aren't we moving? You know, and the truth is they're not moving because you've got a problem where they're 10 feet short and they're trying to work it out. And you've also got uh, Danny, the tunnel king, who's having a little claustrophobic freak out. He's having a meltdown. He's having a meltdown, which is a terrible time, Danny, to have a meltdown, but that's okay. And then the power goes off because there's an air raid and the lights dim down and suddenly you've got a claustrophobic tunnel digger in the dark in a tunnel and, oh my God, the drama is going off. But the fact the tunnel was lit, now that is true. Is it? That's absolutely true. Now, was it gas lamps or what are we Electricity. talking? Electricity. Wow. So they managed to steal some wiring from the camp <laughs> and light the tunnel all the way to the end. That's incredible. Except you couldn't use the lights during the day because they didn't run the power in the camps during the day. Oh, They just... only ran them at night. Because I looked at the lighting and I thought, is this Hollywood? Is no, that a, is that a true Hollywood story. Thing? Wow, that's great. And so during the escape, during the air raid, they did have to relight those fat laps. Right. Which were actually made from margarine. <laughs> That's amazing. They would boil them, take out the water, and then they would use pajama cord as the wick. Wow! The more I hear about it, the more you realise the ingenuity of what these guys did. It is oh, they were very creative. Very creative. It's amazing what they came up with. Like the resources of what they had. It's, it's incredible. So one of the things the movie doesn't talk about during the night of the Great Escape is the fact that the tunnel collapses, or a section of the tunnel collapses, mm. and they have to fix it in the middle of the night which stops them escaping for about an hour. And so because the tunnel is short, they were only getting out about 10 men an hour. Like the movie makes it feel still it's quite fast. Yeah. It was not fast. Because it feels like it's still within an hour, right? Yeah, it, it's not. So it starts at kind of 8.30-ish. Yeah, right. And it goes till about 4 a.m. Yeah, that's a long time. It's a really long time. And they get caught very quickly in the movie. Like, it feels like they yeah, literally only get... It's just not true. It's just yeah. not true. So, like, in the movie, the number they caught is 76. Which is correct. That so is true. That is true. You definitely don't get the idea that 76 people got through that tunnel, though, in the movie. It's it's very quick and... What the movie doesn't show is how long it takes the Germans to realise the tunnel starts in Hut 104. Because, remember, they find it at the outside end. They don't know where it is on the inside end. Right. So as soon as, because they hear a gunshot, and you can obviously hear it in the camp as well as outside. So as soon as they hear a gunshot, a message gets sent down through the tunnel. We've been busted. It's all over. And the first thing they do is they destroy their papers. Right. So what the movie doesn't show is the whole 200 of them are within that hut 104 complex before they get locked into their hut every night. That right. night. Yeah. Because you know in the movie how you see they get locked in? Yeah. Well, when they're locked in, they're actually locked in. Yeah, like with, with locks. Lo- like locked in. Yeah. So they all had to move into that hut before lockdown. Yeah. And so you've got, if we've only got 76 escaping, you've got like 124 men who are still in that hut complex who need to destroy their papers, who need to remove any evidence of their uniforms that suggest they're civilian or they've altered them. Yeah. That so re- people yeah. took buttons off and did all sorts of stuff. Yeah, right. Just because they see the where the hole ends doesn't mean that they have the slightest idea where the hole begins. Because if they did, the Great Escape wouldn't have occurred in the first place. And they, and they need the time. As you say, to get 76 men out, you, you can't underestimate the length of time you need to make that happen because it's – very, it takes ages, right, to get everybody And they up. are using the trolleys and the ropes. That is all true. Yeah, right. But even with that, it's still not a 30-second job. Because, But they did use a garden tool, though, in that scene, Mel, so you're wrong. They did use the garden tool to tap the little cart. Now, right. then the movie's being a bit naughty because right. they wouldn't have been able to use an actual one, but that doesn't mean they could have made it themselves from other parts. 
That is true. That's true. I still, it looks like a garden tool. I'm not saying I'll, I'll I'm right. I'll give you it looks like a garden I'm tool. I'm not saying you're wrong, but it's a, it looks like a garden tool. The movie's not required to follow the parole system. <laughs> true, true. But it was it was good. And and so 76 Get Out, that is accurate. And I do like the idea as well. I love when they're at the train station and all of the actors converge waiting for the train in the morning. And there's a few of them still there and they can't talk to each other. No. They ha- can't acknowledge each other you at can't all. can't acknowledge it, but they all know secretly what they've been through, the ordeal that they've been through. They're probably, you know, celebrating a little bit in their heads. Like, you know, they, we actually did it. We actually got out and we didn't get caught. But there's still this nervousness and you probably want to go over and talk to them and, and talk about it, but you can't. You have to be. But remember, it, most of these guys, it's not their first escape attempt. They're experienced. So Big X, Roger has escaped many times before and sometimes has been out on the loose for weeks. These are not amateurs. Yeah, they know what they're doing. They're disciplined. I find it interesting how Steve McQueen is in a field and then um, everyone else is in the train station. I always kind of go, did he walk there? Okay, so as part of the original plan, they managed to accumulate about 3,000 marks in their kitty. Yeah. So they stole money, all sorts of stuff. So they had 3,000 marks to buy train tickets, which would only allow for a certain amount of guys to catch the train. The rest of them, and they were classified as hard asses, and that's because they were going to have to walk out. They couldn't use the train unless they were going to, like, basically fare evade. And yes. they had ticket inspectors on those trains back in the day, so that's a little bit harder. Yeah. Or they'd have to steal a bicycle or something else. Majority of them out of the 200, if they had got out, would have been on foot. Fascinating. And I suppose that's the safest way, right? You know, to keep away from populated areas and that sort of thing. So this is one of the things that went wrong. Because the snow was so deep, they were forced on the roads because it was too deep to walk through. Of course. Yeah. And you would have been so slow. It would have been so cold as well. They probably wouldn't have been, you know, appropriately dressed for, you know, prolonged exposure to that. I thought, um... I mean, I'm very ballsy from Bartlett and McDonald to, I think it's McDonald to sit beside the Nazis on the train. I think it's the best form of cover. Very good. I was watching it going, this is, cl- he's going to do it. And even to do the kind of like, excuse me, you know, I need this, we need to sit there. And he did know, it without words. He did it without words because obviously they're not uh, full German at all. But actually I thought about this, you know, the only way I could see you effectively escaping is if you were fluent in German. So the guys who actually did succeed in real life yeah. had substantial language skills. You would have to, right? Because he was not an Aussie who escaped. Well, he could I was only just gonna speak say, English. Because I was gonna say I was looking at James Coburn and I was like, this guy, not only can he not speak German, he can't even speak English. He's he's not even Australian. Where he comes from. And he's he's one of the most successful So he's playing a Dutch pilot okay. who actually escapes. Okay. And what the movie doesn't show is it actually t- it took this guy and his name is Bram Verdanstock. Four months to get to England. So he would get... And I guess the French resistance was involved. It's a little bit more detailed than that. Oh, right. He got to Holland. Right. And then he had to wait six weeks. So he's in hiding. Yeah. Until the Dutch underground took him to Belgium. Right. From Belgium. So he's in Belgium for another six weeks. Then he got a train to Paris. Yeah. Then to Toulouse. Then to the Pyrenees Mountains. And then through to Spain. Yeah. And then when he got to Spain, he went to the British consul who then coordinated his way to Gibraltar and then they flew him out to England. Right. But four months. But the other two um, who were Norwegian, they got to England much quicker. Right. And what's really cool about these three is when they arrived safely in England, they wrote back to the camp using code names to let them know they made it. When Richard Attenborough skips, he keeps using his German Yes. And it's so useful because he literally has like a, you know, a, a Nazi vehicle driving past him and he talks his way out of it with fluent yeah, German. He's like, Inglaterra, no. Whatever yeah, yeah. What are you yeah. talking about? Yes, no. Uh, you're a Biobacter. Yes, yes. You know, it was, it was really impressive. Like, and he's, he's only caught because somebody just dead, you know, he recognizes, recognizes him. him. Yeah. It just says like, I know who you are. Herr like, Butler. Yeah. How you going? Yeah. You know, so... They catch McDonald with the old switcheroo where they say, you know, something in English to him. And then he replies in English and then they're like, boom, gotcha. True or false? No. 
Oh, I was going to say it's false. It's true. Right. So it really has happened. So the the guy who was traveling with Roger in real life, that's exactly how he got busted. And they actually said English to him and he replied back. Not just English. They actually said the phrase, good luck. Right. Good Lord. That's hilarious. So the scene you get frustrated by, true story. And he must have been gutted. I mean, what an absolutely terrible way to get caught. The only difference was was where it occurred. They managed to get to the French border before they got busted, those yeah. two. And then, of course, the real tragedy happens, of course, as well. If you don't know the true story, you don't know that they're all, like 50 of them are going to be shot. When Hitler was told about the escape, which was about a day after it occurred, he wanted all the officers to be shot. And eventually he was talked down. And the reason why he was talked down, he consented to this, is because there was concern that if they shoot all the British officers who escaped, the British might, as a reprisal, shoot German officers who escape. Interesting. So there's a little bit of kind of back and forth. And Hitler knew about the escape, right? He directly knew. He knew the next day. He was informed. Yeah, right. And, like, lost it. Right. And he, so, he he was good at you know managing his anger. You know he was a very relaxed, calm, guy. rational yeah, took, person. Took uh, bad news well, and so eventually it was agreed. And Himmler issued the order, who was the head of the SS and the Gestapo, right? That it was going to be fifty. Jeez, that's very. So he actually said that. And time. who who the fifty were? They actually chose them. Right. It wasn't just pick fifty. So there was one. They had the names. They had the names and they had photos and all sorts of stuff because the Germans were meticulous with the records. Yeah. So there's there's one guy, Major John Dodge. He was related by marriage to Winston Churchill. Right. And, of course, they didn't want to kill him. Well, because that would cause a bit of a ruckus. Exactly. So he was chosen not to be part of the fifty. Interesting. But for the purpose of the movie, why are none of the Americans shot? At a propaganda level, American audiences don't want to see all the Americans shot. Like, and then all the British survive. They're like, you know, well, you've got one Australian lives. This is, I'm not paying money for this. I want to see Steve McQueen live, right? Because I always find that Steve McQueen living at the end, I was like, this guy got off lucky. He got off incredibly lucky. Very lucky. And he, and he, and he literally, you know, okay, 20 days in the cooler. I was like, that's it? Another 20 days? I mean... But the real tragedy, of course, is when you've got the prisoners that are held by the Gestapo being driven and they don't know where they're being driven to. And you've got Bartlett and MacDonald in the back of the van. You can see why they they had the dialogue there. And I don't know whether he really spoke this or anything, but of course he says that line of dialogue where he's never been happier. Mm. And that relates to him saying that, look at us, we're escaping we're getting in the face of the enemy. We're we're causing havoc. We're causing havoc. We're escaping. It was one of the greatest escapes ever. And we're going to, do, you get the impression he'll do it again, right? Oh, absolutely. And and you feel like he's, he almost lives to do it. And that, and that's why he's he says the line, he's never been happier. And then, of course, it's at that moment where they cock a gun and you realize that this is the end for, for yeah, all of them. they're being executed. And even now, that sh- it's still shocking to watch that. Even, even the movie that's kind of soft- focused as the great escape is you know you're not getting gore and you're not getting you know visuals of this kind of stuff it's it's such a shocking moment to realize that all these characters that you've nearly spent three hours with are just going to be completely eradicated they are and i think one of the things that's so shocking about it is there's this real sense of cowardice because they're being shot from behind that's right but also there's no trial yeah which is what kind of how we view our sense of justice, is if you're going to be executed, or some would argue in this case just simply murdered, you should have, even if it's a phony trial, some sort of thing that says, these are the charges, these are the evidence, how do you plead? You've been found guilty, you are now being sentenced to death. Instead, these guys are probably taking a leak. I know they're having that lovely speech. Yeah. They're not facing the right way, and it, it's very cowardice. It, it is. It's like a... You know, there's no honor in this at all. No, right? none. None. And and also the way they do it is horrible. I, f- I always hate when they say to them, you know, it's just get out and stretch your legs. It's just horrible because you know they're going to die. But it's just that kind of casual, like, you're going to be on this truck for a while, guys. Just get out, stretch your legs for a bit, and then we'll get back on in a second. And then you realize that's not what's happening. But part of the reason why we know that's not what's happening is because the music is so ominous. Yeah. 
You yeah. can feel that tension building. Cool. Doesn't feel like it's a normal truck ride. And then you're tense and it's funny how music cues you up so well. The music is so good in this oh, movie. It's fabulous. It's absolutely brilliant. Elmer Bernstein is just uh, unbelievable. I imagine if you've never seen The Great Escape, you know the theme oh, of The Great everyone Escape. Everyone knows that theme music. It's just this thing. It's just, it's out in the air, right? You know, it. everyone it's knows what it is. You may not know where it's from. But it's also a little cheeky. And I think that gets the essence of this movie. Mm. This movie is about trying to be uplifted, even though it's very dark. Yeah. But part of its essence is it's sticking it to the man. Well, that's Just the right. man happens to be the Germans. The end of the movie is obviously Steve McQueen being brought back to the original camp again. Mm-hmm. And he's walking in, but... I guess the the payoff for the movie is that he walks in with the same walking defiance. The swagger. The swagger. He still looks pretty fit. He's still a good looking American. And the whole idea is that like, yes, I'm back. It's going to be business as usual. As right? soon as I get out of this cooler. As soon as I get out of this cooler, which is, which is a great way to end it because again, it could have been such a downer, right? It could have been such a downer. It should be a tragic story, but you. And you, in real life, the camp did dig another tunnel. Yeah, right. George. I feel in history that, you know, this tunnel is just one of many tunnels. It was one of, yep. You know, this just just happens to be the one Hollywood told. But to be honest, they could have tried this multiple times before and after, mm-hmm. right? Heads up to, to the Commandant von Luger, who, of course, has been sympathetic with his prisoners up until this point. He's a tough guy, but obviously he plays a Nazi game. But I don't. it's clear that he's not really a Nazi because he doesn't give the Nazi salute. He doesn't give a Heil Hitler you know, around the beginning of the movie. He also, he seems to be pretty nice to most of the prisoners. He's not an oppressive. So in real life, he is a very well-educated man. Right. He's very well-traveled, speaks several languages, had spent time in America. Yeah. He wouldn't have been what you classify as like a standard Nazi, but he was part of the higher Esculons. Right. And after, after this failure... They were going to court-martial him, and the only way he got away with it was he basically faked a mental breakdown. Really? So he got over it? Of course he did. Oh, he got always go to the mental breakdown. That's Always plead that one. Yeah, he just has to, you know, rub peanut butter on himself in the courtroom and he's all good, you know? But in contrast, the electricians that didn't report the wire, the wiring they got stolen for the lighting in the tunnel, right. all shot. Really? So there's definitely an element of class played into how people are treated. Yeah. And again, of course, the final shot of the movie, you know, you you hear Steve McQueen smashing that that baseball against the wall. And there's almost a, when you hear that kind of rhythm of him doing it again, it's like a futility nearly, the futility of keeping this guy locked up. It's just so repetitive. Yeah, It's just like, you're just going to be doing the same thing over and over again. It's completely futile. Let him go. You know, there's a lovely kind of repetition to that. What I also like about that is that would drive the German soldier insane. Because he'd have to stand there all day, right? So in many ways, it's a form of torture against the German. Yeah, it's a good idea. Very effective. Very effective, yeah. it's a, And again, the movie's super, super effective at at, uh, really leaving you with a, I guess, an uplifting feeling at the end, even though you really have grasped that it's a really tragic story as well. I'll tell you what we do need to speak about, though. We do have to talk about the fact that if you're making a war movie, quote-unquote, prison escape movie, tw- less than 20 years after the end of the war, you have access to actors that obviously have real war experience. Absolutely. And certainly military experience in the very least. Absolutely. And so I think this is interesting. This is something that you couldn't get in Hollywood today. Like no. you, you couldn't make a war movie in Hollywood with a whole, like basically an entire ensemble of actors. And no, not just normal actors, mind you. These these guys stood the test of time. I mm. mean, everyone knows who these actors are because their their careers went on to be extremely successful. So um, to go through them though quickly, and some of them, some of the stories are amazing. John Sturge is the director to start with. He made documentaries during the war, so obviously he um, he did have some firsthand experience of filming it rather than fighting in it. Donald Pleasance, Donald Pleasance was a World War II air veteran. He actually was in the Royal Air Force. He flew over sixty Allied raids over occupied Europe and was shot down in northern France. He was actually captured. So this is this is the actor who played Colin. That's right. Yes. He actually captured, he, he was, sorry, he was captured and he was put in uh, one of the yes. camps. So he was in Salak Luft 1. Right. 
And the real camp was... Salak Luft 3. Which is crazy. So right? they're nearby. Yeah. So he's got intimate experience about food, treatment of prisoners, boredom, mental health, escapes, and just how morale would have changed throughout the months of the camp. Yes. I mean, he probably has the most experience of that story than anyone. There's a... The German actor who kind of pulls a gun in hut number 104 when they get busted. Yeah. He is actually, was a prisoner of war in an American camp. Oh, right. And got busted trying to escape several times as well. Ah, right, from the opposite side. From the opposite side. Right, so he would actually know as well. And I know this sounds weird, bro, but I still find it unusual that you would, you still cast German actors to be in an American film playing Nazis who were in fact Nazis themselves at some point, whether they believed it or not, of course, that's Why up to them. Why do you find it weird? I don't know. I, I just find that, like, obviously these are actors that, you know, if you if you reverse the situation, right, you, if the patriotic American, you know, if they had lost the war, would they be playing themselves in German movies as Americans on the losing side, I suppose? You, you, know, you know what I mean? The conflict of interest, especially after... The war's 20 years down the road and, you know, you're starting to probably deal with what really happened as well. I imagine playing a Nazi after actually being one in a movie is tough. I, I think probably what's missing and where the movie does explore a little bit is these men are members of the Luftwaffe. Yeah. They don't view themselves as members, and they're certainly not members of, say, the SS or the Gestapo. Right, which is different. Which is, is different. Yeah. Many of them might have been Nazi Party members. Yes. So, but I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of shades of grey. Yes, right. It, it's, got, it's not just good got, and evil. It's not just good and evil. It's yeah. far too simplistic. Yeah. Remember, the Germans conscripted soldiers. In this in this actor, I, have n I don't know whether... He was conscripted, he volunteered, whether yeah, oh, what true. his involvement in the war effort was. Totally. And and you're right, it's not just, you, you know, people do their duty, they don't follow a regime for political reasons. You know, doing your duty is, is I mean, this Americans do this too, right? You know, it's not like, you know, Americans fight in wars, but they, they're doing their duty. They're not fighting in the wars for political reasons. And, and I think being aware of that nuance, these men would have been. Because mm. at the end of the war, when the Germans ha surrendered, you are rounding up soldiers, member of the SS, etc. You are imprisoning them because you're trying to figure out who needs to be accountable, who doesn't, who is just a random foot soldier. And and the truth is, you know that there's so like you said, this this so it's so complex because and it also takes time. I suppose going back to Donald Pleasance, you know, he he did say because he was in a POW camp and, mm. and it was the Stalag Luft one. He said that, you know, during the film, the making of the film, he would kind of call out occasionally inaccuracies, particularly with Americans. I think he did mention the American thing where he was like, this, And that's this partly isn't... a British-American rivalry British. as well. Yeah, he's a British guy. So he was looking at the way Americans were being portrayed and he was like, I don't know, you know, there's some cowards there. You know, you're not showing those guys. And then, of course, they told him, I think they told him to shut up pretty quickly. James Garner, a Korean war veteran. Um, he has two purple hearts, or he, he did have two purple hearts. What which does that it, mean? Well, it's kind of like the highest commendation you can get in, in combat. It's, wow, it's, impressive. Which is very rare to get one, never mind two. It, it outrageously kind of brave. He was a rifleman in the Korean War. He was wounded twice. First in the face and the hand with shrapnel. In real life, this is what happened. He actually got wounded in the face. And wow. if you look at how beautiful he is, you'd think, keep your face covered. The second time he got shot in the ass... Uh, from friendly okay. from friendly fire from U.S. fighter jets as he dived into a foxhole. So he was wounded twice, and he got two purple hearts for it. So he has um, he has an amazing military history. Absolutely, very very brave. Uh, Richard Attenborough. He wasn't uh, in combat, but he was in the RAF with their film unit. Um, James Donald, who plays the senior British officer, was in the British Army Intelligence Division. Now, this is interesting. Hannes Messimer, who played Commandant von Luger, he has probably the most interesting story as well. So he probably had the toughest experience out of World War II out of everyone. He was drafted into military service during World War II. He was later sentenced after doing military service for the Nazis to five and a half years in prison for refusing to obey orders. That's something Nazis don't take too well. They want you to obey orders. Pardon, he was lucky he wasn't shot because a lot of them would have been. Yeah. Exactly. And so five and a half years in prison, um, he was pardoned after six months 
that he served, and he was transferred to the Eastern Front. Which was the ultimate punishment. Yes, in Russia, to fight the Russians. Of all the front smell that I could pick, the Eastern one would be the last one I'd probably want. It's the cold that will probably kill you. Exactly. And, and that's what did, you know, that's what ruined them is basically lack of equipment and, and the conditions of combat. Were horrendous. Oh, unbelievable. Yeah. Just n- not even um, terrifying to think about. Um, he was captured by the Russians while on the Eastern Front. And just before the end of the war, he was sentenced there to 25 years of forced labor. Um, this is um, Hannes Messimer, an incredible story. How did he escape? Uh, he escaped during a prisoner transport. And somehow managed to walk back on foot to Germany from the Eastern Front, which was um, outrageous. When I read this, and I just looked at the guy while he acted, and I just thought to myself, this man has probably seen more pain in his lifetime than anyone alive today, to a certain extent. But he also understands the conflict and the role of the officer's duty to escape and to cause havoc yeah even though he's on the other side so he gets that well that's right and so and it's ironic that he is he is the main nazi representative of you know in the movie in the movie of the soft officer that is going to give concessions to his prisoners right because he says to ramsay at the beginning may we all see out the war as comfortably as possible and to me i kind of go you know if you're going to hire that guy who's been through that stuff and he's seen some horrific things in his lifetime you know you would expect that it was lucky that he didn't have to play the hard nazi the nazi that punishes people because he probably you know as an actor i don't know if you'd want to do that after experiencing the kind of horrors he went through you could only really cast him as someone that is almost kind of anti-nazi right you you just don't know because you have no idea what his personal experience was what his level of trauma is or also what level and type of acting he was prepared to do well it's true but i just it makes me think about it though i don't know for sure but i just know that surely you wouldn't feel comfortable casting someone with his combat experience and his trauma to be frank to to then have to relive that in some way in a in a really in in an inappropriate way politically possibly i do have to say this there are no female speaking parts in the entire movie there's a couple of female actors in it that sit on a train or stand at a bus stop. That is true, but definitely no speaking. Was there any female people in the camps? So there was definitely no female prisoners okay. in, in this camp. Yeah, okay. Well, that's accurate. That is accurate. Yeah. There's no evidence of any female staff in the camp. I suspect that's probably not quite true. There might have been, say, a typist. Yeah. But you would have noticed the administrative block was actually outside the wire fence. Yeah, sure. So the POWs would have had no connection with those women if that had been the case. Interesting. One of the reasons they you know, didn't finance it immediately through MGM is because they, they looked at it and there was no speaking parts uh, for women and they thought that that wouldn't appeal to female viewers. They literally mm. looked at the script and they thought, well, women are going to pay for this. So you're going to be losing a decent amount of your audience. And so they didn't pay for it at that point. It was only until Sturgis made The Magnificent Seven was, it was hugely successful. It's not a very good movie, but because of the success of that movie, he ended up getting the financing from United Artists because they thought, well, it, you know, you got a blank check. You know, you're, you're clearly successful at what you do. Robert Zemeckis, he uh, obviously he's a big director. He directed the Back to the Future trilogy, mm, Cast big Away, director. very big director. He said in, I think it's Empire Magazine, he said something great about The Great Escape, which I thought summed it up beautifully. He said, it's like high school. The British are the A students, the Americans are the cool kids, and the Germans are the teachers. Which I thought was really good. And I think that is kind of why he thought that it stood the test of time. Because the hierarchies, those kind of oppressive hierarchies that you kind of grow up with, it's all there. And, you know, you can apply that logic to nearly anything. It's not a bad line. So when I was thinking about this, and I don't include the Germans in my analogy, I had it, the Americans take your big risks. Mm. So whether it's your escape to get intel, the scrounging, et cetera, but it's the British who lead it. Yeah. They're the ones with, like, the brains. Yeah. And the Americans just do stuff. And, you know, I give them credit, the British do seem to have the brains in the movie, even though the Americans get a lot of the cool James stuff. James Garner comes across as pretty switched on. He's very smart, and he's, and he's massively important. 
massively important. Like I kind of looked at him and I thought, how is he going to get 250 coats? Like, where is that going to come from? You know, except they didn't automatically get 250 coats. They converted their military coats, many of them into civilian looking coats. Or like, you know, yeah, he asked the guy for a camera, remember, because he, he says, give me a camera. And I'm kind of going, yeah, I could see how he gets the camera. He manipulates the German officer to get the camera. But I still think, God, where the hell am I going to get? You know, the initial kind of... But that also occurred in real life too. There's only so much blackmail you can do, right, surely. So this is what's mo- This is what's missing from the movie, and it was deliberate, right. is how much outside help they got. Okay. And so... The POWs asked the production company not to include some of this stuff in case future generations of POWs needed it. Really? So there were... So they felt very strongly about that. They felt very strongly about, we need to protect these secrets. Because if we just depict these in a movie, then the next time we go to war, they're going to cut off these lines. Exactly. That's interesting. So for example, they would have people from home writing with letters explaining what was going on and things they needed. They had sympathetic people on the outside who would create forged documents for them. There were guards who were sympathetic to their cause where they could get access to different things. Yeah. It wasn't always just blackmail. Yeah, right. Okay. Which in the movie doesn't cover that. You've explained very clearly why that is good. It, it, but it, it, I think that it's a flaw in the movie slightly is you just wonder where it all comes because there's only so many bits of chocolate you can give Germans before they don't give you any more cameras. Totally. But I think there was a real respect that if these guys are asking to not do it for this reason, mm. they wanted to respect that. Very interesting. Yeah, it's it's really, really, it, it's good. I can see why they would feel strongly about that because they went through the real ordeal and it's not worth a Hollywood movie being authentic to, um, you know, disrupt the... Future generations who might need to get stuff, whether it's coming through the Red Cross system or family or people sneaking stuff in through the camps. Yeah. There was a, obviously a little bit of controversy when the film was released around the Americanization of everything. Yeah. That, that was true. Um, I know they did screen the film for, you know, the the real people that were still around that were involved in the original escape and it was all received very positively apart from the fact that it's slightly americanized it kind of reminded me of um i mean in my lifetime which is not a big lifetime mind you a u571 came out in like 2001 and it was the submarine movie jonathan mostow made it and it was about the true story was the british submarine that ended up capturing the enigma machine yes off, i remember this movie. remember that yeah of the german submarine that's right and they had to you know uh, seal the german submarine back the the Americans did the story and it starred John Bon Jovi and uh, Harvey Keitel. And immediately it was like, hang on a sec. Come on, guys. This is not how John this Bon happened. Jovi is, you no, know, no. And so there was so much outrage that they ended up having to put, you know, later, like a little title card that said, um, by the way, British soldiers did actually this. Yeah, did this. Actually yeah. did it. And they, there wasn't a Brit there wasn't a Brit in the whole movie, I don't think, from memory. And it was it was it was a big deal. Like they really you know it's funny, you can miss you can represent different nationalities in different ways, but when you get the, the Brit- essence Brit- wrong. Well, yeah, particularly too with World War Two, when you get the British replaced by Americans kind of thing, it's that's a that's a tricky one. People get annoyed at that. And so I remember that in U five seven one, but yeah, but this is kind of the same, you know, and the whole there is a real focus on the 4th of July and the Americans being the main heroes and everything. So that's probably the only controversy I can think of when the film came out. What's really missing from this movie is the fact that the POWs actually had access to a lot of outside information. Right. So some of the guys built a radio and they were listening to the BBC every day. That's hilarious. And they had guys who would take the key messages on shorthand yeah. And spread it throughout the camp. That's interesting. So they yeah. knew the Germans were on the retreat. They knew before the escape the Western Front had not yet been created. But because these guys are officers and very well educated, they knew enough about strategy that a Western Front would have to be created. Yeah, of course. In order to eventually defeat the Germans and to win the war. So they very much had a sense of, Things were going backwards for the Germans, but they wanted to ramp up pressure, which helps them pick their timings. Yeah, of course. We um we do right have to talk about the box office. Let's yeah? do it. So, film comes out in 1963. It's kind of crazy. The film is known as being a very successful movie. 
That being said, it was the 16th most successful movie of 1963, which you kind of, it doesn't seem very high. And they released less movies back then as well. So it was quite low on the list. I was so you like, wouldn't call it that successful. I was surprised like because I don't know how you felt, but I, I kind of was thinking to myself, this thing must have been huge, like the biggest ever, right? So many of these iconic movies are slow burners. That's true. They take time. That's true. I, I think this might fit into that category as well. Because, you know, the 16th highest grossing of one year, I wasn't massively impressed by that. I was like, all right. So, yeah, cost $4 million to make at the time, which adjusted for inflation is $34 million yeah. approximately. Which is not a big, crazy budget. Not a big one. Um, when they originally tried to get a made, they, they said it would cost too much, which I find weird because the whole movie is based inside one location, but mostly. They had to build that camp. They did have to build it. But it is, I, I just find it strange, you know, I just was thought to myself, really, that's that's too much? Because, you know, it's only one place you got to do. Well, yeah, 34 million, medium size budget, probably today, you know, medium low. Mm. Um, total gross, of course, was 11 million seven. So in for inflation, that's about 100 million flat nearly. So not a bad return on investment. That's worldwide as well, that's everywhere. So it, it did pretty good, it was quite good, but 16th highest grossing movie is not massive. I tell you though, I did look back and I thought, well, if this was the 16th highest grossing movie, what, what else can it beat it? Mm, what, was it what was its competition? It was interesting looking back. It was kind of looking back going, that movie beat it? Really? You know? So um, it did beat Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, so it did beat that. Number 10, Shariad. I've million. never heard of that. It's quite good. It's not too bad. Universal. It was a it, romantic comedy. It's not bad. But the point is the average person would never have heard of that movie today. No. And, and this is what I'm finding None interesting. None of them are iconic. Well, you, I'm curious to what, what you think too, because how, like how many of these movies would you have seen as compared to The Great Escape? It, it's amazing how, how the 16th most highest movie of 63 can be so much more iconic than, say, number one, you know? Uh, yeah. So number nine, McClintock, which is a John Wayne Western. Uh, no, never seen it. Never seen it. It's it's all right. It's but not how many it. John Wayne Westerns are there? There's a lot. Exactly. Like that made quite a bit of money. It made it actually quite a lot more. But that's a perfect date night or family movie. And people underestimate how popular John Wayne was for that. He was reliable. Yep. Reliable entertainment. You knew what you were getting, and people enjoyed it. And you're right, date movie. You know, of course, the bloke would have chosen to see McClintock. I don't think the lady would have chosen. But that if one. you're trying to court someone new, you're not going to take them to a movie about POWs. That's very true, which I think actually they were worried about. And that's part of the reason I think the movie is warmer than it otherwise would be. It, because I think, I honestly think there was a deliberate kind of, you know, let's not make it too tough. The Great Escape still has to be a bit appealing, you know, because you know, commercial things are big. It was not a cheap movie. Uh, the VIPs, which is a drama. I haven't seen that. Dr. No, number seven. First James Bond Classic movie. Classic Bond. Classic Bond. The very first one, too. Uh, 16 million. Uh, Son of Flubber, which we'll not talk about. Irma La Douce, which was a Billy Wilder movie with Jack Lemmon in it, which is a comedy. It's quite fun. It's, Never heard of it. Yeah, you haven't heard of it. It's not great. Uh, it's all right. It's not bad. It's not Billy Wilder's best, but it was okay. Tom Jones, number four. Now, Tom Jones went uh, won Best Picture the following year, okay. cl cleaned up at the Oscars. So it, it did all right. It actually is a huge jump at $37 million. Uh, Stanley Kraber's comedy, It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, which is very funny and is very good, but I imagine you probably... Never seen it. Have you heard of it? No. They see, this is, this is the thing. The Great Escape is doing very well for the 16th in the list. How the West was won, which is a famous Western. It's not an amazing movie, but... So you've got two Westerns in the top 10. It's it's big. How the West won was a huge success. It's a very strange movie because um, they shot it with three cameras at the same time. And because they shot it with three completely different cameras per one image that you see, there's a every third of the picture is a different color to the other third. Does that you, just not look weird? It looks weird. Even though it's the same image, right? So you'll be acting, but you're the colors of the image are split in three. It's very strange. It was actually projected with three projectors to make that happen. Very odd. Yeah, that's not going to work. Very, very strange. Um, but yeah, huge success. And number one, we probably will do this movie. When, we, when we're really, say they say where the viewership goes down quite a bit, we're going to pull out the Cleopatra card. because Oh, Cleopatra was, so that was still number one. It was still number one. So how was Cleopatra not viewed as a huge success if it was still the, the most highest grossing film for its year for the whole year and, uh, and uh, how is that a failure I, and that shows you how expensive that movie was because it actually made 11 million nearly more than second place and it's still considered one of the biggest flops of all time i mean that says just more about 
That's just investment irresponsible. Investment on return. No, no, that just says more about investment and return. It's crazy. Like, I actually think how much money, you know, how did they ever think it was going to be a success? And if you, they if you must can't have make, known that it was too expensive. Oh, easily. Yeah, yeah. It is. And it, we will cover it at some point, but if you do watch it, I mean, the truth was is that you just look at it and you go, it just looks incredible, but you don't need half of it. No, and, and someone was negligent in signing that off. Oh, it's completely. With that kind of budget. 57 million, which is huge amount adjusted for inflation. It was number one and it's still a flop. It almost tanked the studio. 20th Century Fox almost tanked because of it. Uh, but we will cover that movie at some point as well. Do you, you want to bring something up before we go? Well, I was just actually, no, I think we've done enough of oh, the please. true and false stuff. Oh, please. Yeah, we can, we can go through that. All right. I'll, I'll give you just like a couple. Let's go. One of the key problems when you're trying to escape is not the digging, but it's getting rid of the evidence, the sand. Yes. Much bigger problem than the digging. Well, actually, I would suggest a much bigger problem than it looks in the movie because it, the way, the way I figured that they solved the problem in the movie is that a few people walked over to the grass, or sorry, sorry, to the, the plowing bits and then just kind of brushed a few bits of dirt from their shoes, brushed it in a bit, said, hello, sir, and walked off. And I'm like, do you know how much dirt there would be? There would be tons. Tons. And there were tons. It'd be like excavating a building site. It would be outrageous. Yeah, so... So I mean, that that little sequence you're talking about, the men walking to the garden and letting some dirt loose. Yeah, that's actually true. So they had what they they called them penguins, <laughs> and they had because the Red Cross thought they're in Poland, it's going to be cold. They gave them a stack of what they called long johns. Oh yeah, the officers hated them because <laughs> they look really daggy. It's what your grandpa wears, etc. Yeah, they're not cool. They are not cool. Steve McQueen didn't wear those. He did not wear them. No. And his khaki pants never looked dirty except when he was badgering. That's true. They I, were immaculate. I don't know. That blue jumper holds up. I don't know. That guy went through like a lot of barbed wire and there wasn't a bloody hole in that jumper at the end. It was shockingly a pristine condition. That's but, yeah, right. But, it's crazy. They absolutely did use that kind of penguin thing yeah. to open up the sand, but they had dirt everywhere. Oh, really? In the roof, under the theatre, like you name it. They did do a thing. There was a very small part of the movie that does discuss the dirt in the attic, which yeah. I did hear that. And I did think to myself, okay, at least that's something. I so mean, windy days are great for getting rid of dirt because mm. you can just release it and it flies away. That's true. I imagine on a windy day, it looked like a pure fog out there. There might be, oh, lads, it's, it's windy. Get out of there. <laughs> Get rid of the dirt. So, um, yeah, okay. So that so it's true. Have you got another one for me? Yes. Okay. I am very tense about this. I want to get these right. Wow. Because well, you've had a few that weren't quite... I'm nervous, man. I haven't got anything right so far. Let's All go. Right. So this one. Okay. The 50 who were shot, yeah. were they shot together? I'm going to say no. You are correct. Yeah. It just seemed a bit too good to be true. Yeah. So as a general rule, they were either shot in pairs or individually mm. and often by a pistol. What a horrible, horrible way to have to... Um, I mean, there are far worse ways to die, let's be honest, let's, than let's a bullet dis- to the head. Let's discuss those. Let's, no, no, we're not going to... No, we're not going to discuss yeah, them. It's true. It's true. So I, it did feel a bit convenient to get through. That seemed like a plot device to get it done as quickly as possible. And also, there's only, there's only so much tragedy at the end of the movie you can take, so you should do it all at once, right? But if you just do it individually and show it, show it like that, it would be horrible. I think also by using the machine gun, it builds up way more tension. And the noise of it too, you know, that sudden like, oh God, it is really, really like, you know, going from a quiet field to hearing this sudden burst of like, you know, yeah. anger. And there's also a lack of violence in this movie. That's true. Now for a war movie, you generally think there's going to be a lot of violence. Yeah. So I suspected they needed to show a certain amount of horror. True. Which you could do that through a massacre. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't quite have that same effect if it's one or two being shot at. And I would say it's effective all the more because of the fact there isn't that much of it. And Roger looks so happy a second beforehand. I agree. Like he looks really at peace. He does. Look, overall, I think based on what you're telling me then, it sounds like the movie's pretty accurate. It's very close. That's good. And I think there's a real kind of commitment to telling this story as far as reasonably possible, as close as possible. Excellent. Well, that's good. So hopefully, what I'm hoping is that by us discussing it, we're going to inspire a few people to get out and actually watch this movie. I hope so. It's a really good picture. 
Have we discussed what we're doing next? Do we know what movie we're going to do after this? Well, we did have a brief discussion and but, we think we were going to land on quills. That sounds like a good idea, actually. Very different. Very different. We, different era. We didn't want to do multiple war movies. Certainly not multiple World War II movies. Which we could do, but we're not going to do that. No, no, no. We're going to space our World War II movies out a little bit. So quills. There's a, also women in this movie. That's true. That's good. It would be nice to talk about anything other than a bunch of dirty men for a while. But there will be mental health elements. That's true. Actually. Sections in an asylum. And, you know, it's kind of disturbing. You know, let's face it, the source material is not exactly, like, happy, you know, reading. Look, but I haven't read any of his stories yet. I haven't either, actually. I'm, I'm worried. I'm, tr- I'm intrigued. I'm very nervous. I'm just saying I'm nervous. I'm nervous.